So I'm Lex McCusker. I'm the, the head of the GW New Venture Competition. Uh, by way of background, um, most of my career was spent in technology at uh, Bell Labs and AT&T. Um, though I did a stint as the dean of the business school at Stevens Institute in Hoboken, New Jersey. Um, I, I guess <laughs> entrepreneurship is my life because even for fun what I do is uh, angel investing and, and advising the early stage startup teams. Um, you can always reach me by email and that's my cell phone number. Uh, don't be shy about calling. If, uh, if I don't want to talk to you, I won't. Um, so let me give you the, uh, the one minute summary of, of, of the messages today. So if you have to leave, you at least have gotten this, right? So today I'm going to talk about one method of doing a pitch. And it's a method that I, I particularly like. Um, I see scores of pitches every month and probably have seen a thousand in my, in my lifetime. Um, I, I do have, no, come on, don't be shy, don't be shy. Um, I do have a particular style, style that I like, and um, I will, uh, I'm, I'm aware of my biases, so I will point out to you other ways to do this. This is not the only way, it's a way. It's also tailored to the GW New Venture Competition. So my, my, the, pitch, the pitch advice I'm going to give you here is for a very friendly audience of, of folks who are um, looking, looking to fund your activity on behalf of GW. So it's, it's slightly different from what you might find if you were pitching uh, venture capitalists or, or uh, angel investors. So be a little bit aware of that. Um, it is definitely uh, suitable for social entrepreneurs as well as, as commercial entrepreneurs. Um, if, if for, for the socials among in the group, if, if there's something that you think doesn't apply, jump in and, and, and keep me honest about that. Um, and as I say, I will recommend other approaches. But here's the main message. Anybody can do a great pitch especially on a topic where you are the world's expert, which is the case for your venture, right? So um, the secret to it, is there a secret? I can give away the secret at the beginning. Everyone's going to leave, but I'm going to give away the secret. The secret is, is not in your, in your slides or in your uh, financials. It is how you connect with the audience. So I'm going to talk about today is, 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 is more like drama and, and, and uh, uh, screenwriting, right? Cause, cause and the best way to do that, by the way, is, is, is not to, to, to be something you're not. So um, when you get to these pitch uh, competitions, these pitch, the, the, and, and the folks in the new venture competition are the final 10 out of 106 that started in, 2000, in, in January, uh, you're good. You don't have to be anybody you're not. So let the, let the real you come through. You're, you're wonderful, and let the, let the judges get that. What they do want to see is that you have some passion, some affection for your venture. Right? It's not something you do because the, you know, because Professor Solomon made you do it in your class. Right? That you love this venture. They want they want to feel that, and they want to like you. They want you to like them, and they want to like you. So that's it, it's it's more touchy feeling you, than you might have thought. But that's 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 the secret. All right. So I mentioned one of many models. I'm going to give you mine. Uh, oh, I did that already. So. Here's the agenda. I'm going to give you a quick executive summary of all the important points. Then I'm going to talk about preparation, especially about knowing your audience. Then we're going to talk about the judges and what, what are the judges really looking for. Then we're going to, I'm going to describe something called the narrative arc. I want you to, again, to think about this as a screenplay. Think of it as writing a script for an interesting story that someone would want to hear. I will go through a, a sample pitch deck, one that I particularly like, and I'll show you slide by slide what I think should go into that deck. Um, and we're going to talk about the Q&A. Q&A is as important as the pitch, believe it or not. Then I will give you some, uh, some other approaches, uh, talk about the Audience Choice Award. Recall that, that, that the, in the, the way the, the, the contest is structured, uh, the teams pitch during the day to the judges, and they come back at night and do a shorter pitch for the Audience Choice Award, and there's some important differences there. And then I'll spend probably the last half hour talking about general things for any kind of a pitch. Any kind, anytime you're talking in front of an audience, there are certain things about um, physical appearance, hand gestures, what the slides should look like that, that we'll, we'll finish up with. Okay? Um, the slides are posted. They're posted on our website. I think I have that somewhere here. Yeah. So everybody know this site? Newventure.gwu.edu is, is the website for the New Ventures. Under workshops, presentation, videos, there's a wealth of information there. If you haven't visited that site, uh, go there tonight, go there tomorrow. All the past presentations are there. 
All these workshops are captured. The slides from tonight are there. So if you, uh, you didn't catch a URL or something, um, you can see really good pitches. Right? You can see what the best of the best did last year. In fact, for the last nine years, it's all there. Right? This is a wealth of, uh, of good information for you. Okay, so here's the executive summary. What you're trying to do is get this audience hooked. Get them excited about what you're doing. Uh, the metaphor I use is get them up the hill. Push them up to the top of the hill and then keep them there. Right? So it's easy. You start fast. Easy to talk about, right? Get them oriented and connect with them. And connect with them emotionally as well as intellectually. We'll talk about that a lot. Get them excited. Keep them excited. And once, you got, once you've done that, summarize and close. Right? Easy enough. So, first thing is to know your audience. What are these folks who are listening to your pitch? What kind of human beings are they? Well, there are two things. They're risk takers and risk mitigators. Right? They, they are, by definition, risk takers. They're looking to invest money in chancy, almost unlikely things, but they do it with their heads. They, they are looking for ways to keep, mitigate, my, uh, make that risk as small as possible. So they are very savvy risk takers. They are, in fact, and I, I like this, I'm a, I like Dr. Seuss, right? So that I think of them as the characters, thing one and thing two, because they are multiple personalities in the same person. And in the course of your pitch, you will see both sides. Right? Thing one wants to find the best, the new, new thing. They spend their time listening to pitches because they want to find that thing that's going to really make them exciting. They're always on the lookout for the latest thing, that new idea, that new invention, that new venture that's going to make them rich and they get really excited about it. And frankly, when they come in the room, they're full of hope because they want you to be that thing. They want to fall in love with you. They're looking for romance. They want you to be the thing they've been looking for. And you want to make sure that you convince them that they are. They, but, they, and they, but they see hundreds of pitches. And they all claim to be the new, new thing. And they're frequently disappointed. But that's OK. Because once they think they've found it, when, they, when you've gotten them hooked and you, you got them convinced that this is a big deal and it's the thing they've been looking for, they flip. They become thing two. Now they've found something they want. And now they want to know all the reasons why it's going to fail. Now they, they, they become risk, risk averse. And so they're going to spend the, the second part of your talk worrying about all the ways that this could screw up. So you want to see them for what they are and recognize that they're going, they're going through this emotional roller coaster with you. Right? The point is you have to feed them what they eat. In the beginning, you've got to give them a reason to be excited. As you progress through the talk, you've got to answer their fears and their concerns and, and make sure that, that they get confidence that you can deliver on this, on this wonderful thing you're offering them. Everybody with me? All right. So preparation. Know your audience. For those of you in the con 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 competition, have you gone to this website and looked up the, the judges? OK. That's the next thing you should do tonight. So please, let's pass these out. Jen, make sure that the folks who are in the competition I don't have enough for everybody. But So on our website, we have profiles of all the judges. Here they are. Here's what they do, the companies they're in. You can Google all these people. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that they have preferences, they have prejudices, they have things that they particularly like, they have things they're particularly strong at, right? So go find out who these people are and make sure that you're answering what they are going to be interested in. This is especially true if you're pitching, if, in, a, in another context, if you're pitching to VCs or angel investors. Right? They all have a well-known profile. It's always on the web. You can find out what their funds invest in. You can find out what they like, what kind of companies they like. Do that homework. Go find your audience and know in advance who you're talking to. Know the criteria. Right? I'm sure you've all been to this site and you know the criteria. The judges are going to sit there and score you on a one to seven scale on each of these dimensions. Make sure you make it really easy for them to, 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 know that, to, to, to judge you high on your understanding of the customer need and the market. 
Make sure you make it really easy for them to understand what your team is and what the management capabilities are, right? Basic stuff, but homework you got to do. Again, this is all presented for you, laid out very clearly on the New Venture website. All right, so your first quiz question. What are the judges judging? Your venture, right? They're judging your venture. They want to know if this is a good business. Yes, yeah, somebody think they're judging your venture. Oh, come on, nobody. Yeah, okay, calm, thank you. How about your plan? You're laying out a plan of action. Are they judging your plan? Yes, but what are they really judging? Come on. You! They are judging you. And that's harsh, right? You're standing up there in the spotlight. You, you poor millennials, you don't want to judge anybody or don't want to be judged. But life is tough. They're judging you. What they say, what's, what, what, what's the aphorism that they use? You bet on the jockey, not on the horse. What do they mean by that? It's much better to have a mediocre venture with a good team than to have a mediocre team with a good venture. Because it changes all the time. You guys, how many, how many times have you been through changes in your own venture? How many times have you pivoted and redone it and redefined it? When you brush up against customers, you find out stuff that is just wrong. You didn't understand. It's different. And they want, they want people who can do that. So what's the first thing they want to know about you? What's the most important thing that they're judging you on? They're going to judge you on a lot of things, but what's the most important? Go. That is one of them. It's not the most important. Integrity. They want first and foremost to be absolutely sure that you are a person of the highest integrity. Why is that? Well, we all want that, right? Everybody I meet and my friends, it matters to them because they are thinking that they're going to give you their money and they don't have any way to watch you or watch over you on a day-to-day -day basis. They'll come to your monthly meetings. They'll have a board seat on your advisory board. But they can't watch you. They have to trust you. And so integrity is the first and foremost thing. What else? Passion. They want you to care. They want you to care very much about your venture. And why is that? Well, sometimes they're nice people, but they want you to care passionately about making money for them. If they're going to invest in your venture, in your, even if it's a social venture, they want it to succeed. They may want it to succeed for its social value. They might want it to succeed for its commercial value, but they want it to succeed, and they want to know that you want it to succeed every bit as much as they do. So they want to see passion and believe that you have passion for this idea. If you're a dabbler, they're not interested. Now, lots of other stuff. They, they, keen to see your experience, right? There's, there's lots of things about you that will help them know if you're going to succeed. They want to know your, your knowledge and skills. They want to know about your leadership and your commitment. Do you have a vision for the, for the, for the future that, that's powerful? Can you bring other people along? Are you a leader? All those things are important. So don't get me wrong. But, and then finally, last but not least, are you coachable? Can you listen? Can you take advice? Are you able to, to talk to folks who are more experienced than you in some aspect of this and sift through the advice? Because you get lots of advice. Some of it's good. Some of it's lousy, right? But are you coachable? Can you take good advice and know how to use it? All right. So David S. Rose is the... Uh, godfather of angel investors, probably the single smartest angel investor in the country. Um, he has a bunch of YouTube videos on this. We'll, I'll point to them later. Um, if you want to spend some time and look at David S. Rose, the pitch coach, this is a great place to go and, and, and get into the, the mind of, of prospective investors. All right, the narrative arc. Let's talk about the narrative arc. So I try to convince you that you should think of your presentation as a drama. Not like Silicon Valley, not a, not a comedy, not a sitcom, right? But a drama. And here's, here's one that works. This is, this is almost a standard one. They don't, they, don't, they don't all follow this. They don't have to follow this, right? But you want to start with the opening act. And the opening act is, there's a big problem out there. I have found this big problem. And it's an important problem. But I understand it. 
I understand the people, I understand how they're dealing with it now, and I even can quantify. I know how big this problem is, because I've been really wallowing in it, right? But, good news, we have a solution. I can fix this problem. I have a product, and we know how to deliver it. We know the value that we bring to our customers. And by the way, we have a team. We have the team that can really deliver. We're the cavalry coming to the rescue, right? Right? It's an exciting story. Now, we have, oh, by the way, there's some details that I want to tell you about, just to convince you that we know how to do it. That's Act 4. So we, know how to, we know how to market. We know how to run our operations. We have a financial statement that, that convinces us and others that we can make money. And in fact, we can really grow. And then finally, you close. Here's what I want from you. Starts off early on, gets very exciting, and gets a little bit tactical. And at the end, when you got them, you close. Right? That's a narrative arc. Think, think, think of a storyline like that that, that that you have that sits up and sings. Leah? Generally, generally, so, so if you're pitching to real investors, if you're going in to pitch an angel investor group, you make a very specific ask and you tell them what you're going to do with the money. It's a little trickier here, but you should do something the same. So what, and, and what people have done in the past is they say, ah, with the $35,000 first prize money, I will hire two programmers and I will build a website and I will do some marketing and so... Um, you should probably make an ask of that sort. Now, some of you have ventures where $35,000 will get you a long way. Some of you have, have ventures where you're going to need a million dollars to do clinical trials, and so an ask for $35,000 $35, seems a little hokey. But, so use your judgment about that. Yeah. All right. Now, remember, you're tr yes, ma'am. I think what you want to talk about is, is what you would do with financing beyond the competition. Okay. So this is a little bit of inside baseball, but the way the competition is structured, there are cash prizes for first, second, third, and fourth, but then there are special prizes that add on, right? So you could be the first place winner and the most, uh, uh, best international, the best high tech. So you could win more than $35,000. In general, I, w I would talk about what you would do if you had a $35,000 infusion. And I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it, but you might want to have another slide that says, and if we ha have a half a million dollars, here's what we will do. You with me? Okay. All right. So there are things that get them up the hill, keep them excited, get them interested, and you want to do as many of these as you can. By and large, you want to have a nice logical progression. So your story should flow in a logical way. It should be easy to follow. You should talk about things they can relate to. So try to make it as, as human as you can. Um, Judges are, are, are a special kind of human, right? These are generally successful business people. They're a little bit hard-nosed. They can be um, callous, frankly, um, but try to relate to them and things they know. They do like external validation, right? So they don't know you from Adam. They don't know if you're, you are making lots of claims that they can't possibly tr test, right? So they like external validation. If other people have invested in your company, if they're awards you've won, there are, there are contests that you've secured. In fact, winning a uh, prize in the new venture competition will give you a validation that you can take forward to other, to other competitions, right? Um, they also want a believable upside. So, so you want to show them that, you, that you have a, your company has great potential, but it's, it's a bit of the Goldilocks. You don't want to say, you know, we're going to conquer the world, we're going to be Facebook in, in, you know, in, in a month, right? So a believable upside matters to them. There are also things that you can do that are that kind of inadvertently that can really shake their confidence in you and allow them to go back down the hill. Remember, integrity is the first order, so saying things that are untrue or things they know are untrue will get you into big trouble. Don't bluff. If you don't know something, say you don't know. No one's expecting you to know the answer to every question or to know everything. Stay to the facts and don't use mushy language. Right? Don't speak imprecisely unless you really have to, unless, unless you're trying to convey imprecision, right? If you've done 100 customer interviews, say I've done 100 customer interviews. In fact, if you've done 103 customer interviews, say I've done 103 customer interviews. I like precision. Right? 
Don't say I've done lots of customer interviews. Because they're cynical people and they will assume that you are BSing them, that you're trying to exaggerate and that you've done two or three interviews and you're, and you're calling it lots of interviews. Right? Don't muddle up your tenses. If you have something that is going to happen in the future, use the future tense. If you have something that is real and happening now, use the present tense. Don't mix those up. If your system will be built in three months, don't, don't tell us what the system does. Because it doesn't do nothing. It doesn't exist yet. And it looks like you're being tricky. You're not. You're just being careless. You're being a little sloppy with the language. right? But don't talk about things in the future using the present tense. Does everybody understand that? Um, don't talk about things they don't understand, so be careful about acronyms or special words, right, or, or code phrases. Um, colloquial young people language won't go over with them, right? You're not trying to confuse them, right? Um, inconsistencies matter, right? So if you have $10,000 of revenue in the first year, and that's what it says in your income statement, don't say somewhere else that you've got $9,000 in revenue in the first year, or $12,000. If, if, if you have $10,000 in, in gross revenue and $9,000 and, and $9, in net revenue, only use one number. Because it looks like you're either being sloppy, which is bad, or worse, you're being deceptive. Inconsistency is a red flag to them, right? And then finally, errors, typos, sloppiness, stuff that doesn't matter when you're with your buddies, and again, is, is something that causes them to infer that you're a careless person, and they don't want somebody who's going to be careless with their money. Yeah? OK. Now, here's my, here's my good pitch deck. Jasmine, if you would give everybody one of these. So I'll show, I'll show you the deck that I like. I'll, you'll get a sense of the narrative arc that I like. And then I'll, I'll go back, and we'll, we'll talk about others, what other people are doing. So remember, you've got 12 minutes. So what I'm showing here is, is the slides on this deck. Um, what the thematic arc is, and how long I would spend on each slide. So I, my style is to move fairly quickly through a, a, a large number of slides. I like an introductory slide that lays out the whole story on one page. Other folks don't do that. Other folks like to start with the suspense. Personally, I don't want a suspense. I'm not, I'm not there to, uh, for the drama. I want the facts, ma'am. So that's, that's my bias. But think about, you all have a 20-word pitch. Start with that tagline, that 20-word pitch. And then tell them the status. We have a product that exists. We have revenue. We have things that the major milestones or not. We're still in beta. We're still, still conceptual. Tell them what the status of the product is. Talk a little bit about the team. This is a bit of a tough one. Some, some, some people introduce the team right away at the, at the beginning. Some people wait till later on in the talk. I think for the new venture competition, it's best to introduce the team up front because Recall in the, in, the, in, the, in the new venture competition, every team member has to speak. So you might as well introduce them in, in, in the beginning, right? And then uh, I, I, would, I would, you might, in, in some senses, I would preview the ask. I would, I would ask up front and then ask again at the end, right? Then, then I would spend time on the problem. And I would, I, I would devote a full minute. So a minute out of 12 is big. That's, that's a lot of time, right? Here's the problem, major trends. We, you know, again, you have to appeal, appeal to their heads as well as their hearts. Talk about why the current solutions don't work. That's often a good one, right? There's a big problem, a big opportunity. Customers really need this. The people are starving. There is money being wasted. And what they're doing now is a disaster, right? And then that sets them up for good news. Here's our product. Here's how it works. Now, it is very important that they get how your product or service works. If you lose them at this point, Right, where they can't really figure out how it works or what the interface is or how somebody uses it, they're going to spend the next five or six minutes thinking about that and ignoring everything else you're saying. So work hard on this. Um, it's, a, it's a tough call on how you do that, but think about things like props. Like if you have a sample, if you have a physical product, bring it in. In fact, bring in 12 of them, pass them out, let them feel it and touch it. That's a good way for them to feel how it works, right? Screenshots are good. If you have a website, if you think it's complicated, show them some screenshots. Um, video, 
Video is, is another possibility. Video is tricky. Uh, it's hard to get a good crisp video that makes efficient use of your time. But some of you have products or services or complicated dashboards that you might want to invest 30 seconds or even a minute showing somebody pecking away at your app or, or using it. Uh, tough call. Um, a, a demo. When, when is it appropriate to use a live demo? When should you use a live demo? Never, never use a live demo. They always mess up. They always mess up. It's not worth it. Nobody wants a live demo. Nobody expects you to do a live demo. You're asking for trouble. A canned demo, I'm all for. So if you, if you, if you think you want to videotape your system in action and embed that 30-second video in your talk, that's OK. Do not do a live demo. Ma'am. Like a bribe? Sure, sure. Um, in the past, teams have made very good use of, of, of products and samples and, and had beverages. The kombucha guys gave them all you know, cups of, of kombucha. Um, it, sorry to say, if you have a nice product, it gives you an advantage. You can, you can, you can convey to them. In fact, when you walk into the, into the room right before the clock starts and you go around and introduce yourself and shake hands, you can give them the product off the clock. Right? It's almost cheating. but. It's a great way so they get immediately what your product is, and you haven't even used any of your 12 minutes. Right? So yes, good question. Thank you. All right. Um, at this point, you've got to have them hooked. So how far in is that? One, two, three, four, four minutes in. At this point, you've got to have them hooked. Now you're going to start talking about all the things that, that, that are, to, to speak to their, their fear of risk. right? You should talk about the buyer ecosystem. If you're selling this thing on the web and it's easy, then maybe that's no problem. And you've got, as a minute, you can use somewhere else. If you're selling a, pro a, a product into a hospital, for example, selling into a hospital is very difficult. And you want to, you, it's worth a minute to show that you know who would be the buyer, who would be the user, who are the influencers, how that decision is made in a, in a complex ecosystem. So think about how to use that time. You clearly want to convey to them that you know the customers and the market, and you have a, com a compelling value proposition. So the, the, these folks are all steeped in the lean startup, as, as are you. They will, have, they will expect you to talk lean startup. They will expect you to have, have some kind of traction in the marketplace. So if you're selling product, that's the best kind. If you're not selling product, they will expect you to have talked to lots of customers, funders, as well as beneficiaries, and that you will know what the value is to them. The more of you, that you have, the better. Very important to you, right? All right. And then that there's a large addressable market. So you do, it's, it's a compulsory chart on a total addressable market, a served available market, and the target market. Never spend more than 30 seconds on that. The only message is it's a very large market. Right? All right. Now, other things they're going to worry about. Do you have barriers to entry? Are there things that, that you're going to do that are going to keep the competitors from swarming in on this market? Do you have patents? Do you have intellectual property trade secrets, special relationships with vendors that, that maybe could keep people out? You don't have to have that. But you have to be thinking about how you're going to compete. And maybe just getting to market fast, getting to market with a superior product is, uh, is enough. right? But, but speak to it specifically. And then talk about the competitors. Another compulsory slide is uh, a slide on the competitors. The standard way of doing this is a matrix, right? You put the, the most important elements of the value proposition on one side, right? You make a list of them. And you put the competitors across the top with yourself. And you put a check mark into uh, next to every, every item that a competitor has. And lo and behold, you have all of them. But the competitors are kind of sparse. They only have some. They don't have all of them, right? But that's a nice way in, in a single chart to show how you stack up against the competitors. It is a fatal flaw, as in dead, die, stop there, and go home, if you say there are no competitors. If you say there are no competitors, the judges immediately know that you are a fool. There's always competitors. What they're doing now is a competitor for you, right? Somebody who's attacking it from some other way with some other product or some other solution will be solving that problem for them. You want to be really knowledgeable about the competitors, right? Talk about how you're going to go to market. Yes, ma'am. Competitor also might be how they're solving. You're saying the consumer is solving the problem for themselves. There might be something super obvious 
the link, like writing something on a piece of paper instead of your online app. But there's always some competitors. Yes. Thank you, Melanie. So, so alternate solutions to the problems are competitors, even if you think they're low tech and hokey, right? You want to show your financial plan. In the slide deck, you want to have a very simple income statement with the cash, cash requirement overlay. Remember Steve Rogers uh, talked about this. In the deck, you want to have a, a single, very simple slide. Point out the key things that they are looking for. Remember the key things they are looking for, right? They want to know when you're going to become cash positive. Doesn't that be the first year, second year? Doesn't that be the third year? But at what point do you start to generate enough cash that you are paying you? covering your expenses. That'll matter to them. They'll want to know the, the, the benchmarks, especially gross margin, right? When do you reach a, a gross margin that is competitive with the, with the industry, right? They'll want to see that. Um, uh, how fast do you get to be a big company, right? They, they're looking for somebody who's going to become a $100 million company. It doesn't have to be a year. It could be five years, but they're looking for some significant growth, right? And then, again, benchmarks return on sales, right? Software companies should have big return on, on sales, right? All right. Uh, then the team. Be sure you talk about the team. Talk about the team in terms of the skills that this business needs and how many of them you have. They don't expect you to have all the skills. They do expect you to know what skills you need to be successful and have a plan to get them, right? College students, right? You don't have all the skills you need on your team. You probably don't have a professional sales force. Maybe you don't need one, right? You probably don't have an army of, of software developers. But don't, don't be naive and, and, and let them think you don't know what you, don't, what you need, what you need, what you don't need, what you need, what you need, right? It's OK not to have them. It's not OK not to have a plan to get what you need, right? And I like why, why us, why now? This is, this is now you're selling, you're trying to close. Talk about why it is you, got, you are special and you can do this. And a lot of you, it's going to be just around your passion for the, for the topic. It's something you really care about. And that's, that's a good thing to have, right? Then ask, show them how you're going to use the funds. The funds, use of funds matters, right? So you're going to get $35,000. How are you going to spend it? They want to see that you've been thoughtful about how you'll spend it. That's called use of funds. Important. And then summarize. Again, this is your whole narrative arc on a slide. Go back and, sh and talk about the problem, the solution, the competition, and leave that slide up. So when you finish, that slide stays on the screen as a constant reminder to them of your narrative arc. All right, you with me on this? Questions, comments? Really concise, amazing, wonderful. <laughs> Well, this is actually wordy. As, 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 as I show you some of the other recommended pitch decks, this is like verbose. OK. All right. The art of the Q&A. Q&A is important. You start with 12 minutes to pitch, and then you have eight minutes of Q&A. So 40% 40 40 of your time is in the Q&A. Right? And you can't convey everything you want to convey in the 12 minutes. It's just too much. Right? You've been working on this for months and months. You couldn't possibly tell them all the stuff you want to tell them in 12 minutes. That's the way it is. But that's good news. You, you have eight more minutes to, to give them additional information to supplement what you've told them. And it's directed by them. So you're providing them the information that, that they say they still want to have. Right? So the Q&A is hugely valuable to you. Um, the, most important skill in the Q&A is not your answer, but it's listening and getting the question. So you want to be efficient in the use of the time, but make sure you understand the question before you answer it. And in fact, some active listening might be appropriate. Right? So if they say, um, tell me about uh, the competition you're likely to see in the Midwest, you might want to play that back to them and say, I understand what you're asking about. You would like to know about the XYZ company and its subsidiary in, in San Francisco, uh, the, which, which would be the Western competition. Is that correct? So taking a, a second to play back the question and make sure that you understand it and give them a chance to correct you if you didn't get it right. Is time well spent? Because then you want to give a nice crisp answer to, that, to, the, to the right question. Right? You don't want to, the last thing you want to do is spend time answering a question they didn't ask. You heard it, but they didn't ask it, right? So questions come in three varieties. 
The first kind is not good. It's the I didn't get it question. So if they say to you, oh, I still don't understand how your product works, that's an oh fooey moment. But it's recoverable, right? So take that time and go back and explain to them how the product works because if, if they don't get over that, you're never going to get them, right? Or if they say to you, I don't really understand <coughs> why a purchasing uh, officer in a hotel would want to buy your computer system. They, don't, they didn't get the value proposition. So backtrack, recover, take time and answer that question. Second kind of question is the I'm really smart question. So they'll, they'll show off. Are you aware of the XYZ company? I invested in them in uh, 1959, uh, and uh, they had a product that was similar to yours. Well, who gives a shit, right? I mean, but, but it, take that as an opportunity to, to speak to the issue and to do it forthrightly. Say, yes, that's a very good company. I know that company. Their product uh, crashed and burned uh, two years later. But we have, we have something that's, that's similar but much better. Right? So uh, don't take offense. Don't get put off by it. Answer it politely and move on. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Say, I, I'm not familiar with that company. I'll have to I'd like to follow up with you afterwards and learn more about it. You don't have to know everything. And you mustn't bluff. Now, the best kind of question is an implementation details question. If they say to you, oh, so how are you going to, you told us why you're going to sell this in the, uh, in the big, greater DC region and, and, and move into the United States. How are you going to go international about this? That question, the underlying premise of that question is, I'm bought in. I agree with all the other stuff. I want to know about the future. I want to know how you implement. I want to know how you're going to get really big and be successful. So those questions mean that they love you, and, they, and they, you got them. They're hooked. So answer those questions with, uh, with confidence and enthusiasm. Now, here's how to get the most out of the Q&A. Right? You, remember, you, you, you're giving a talk in front of a screen on the, on the stage in the Jack uh, Morton Auditorium. Come forward now. The whole team comes forward. Make sure you get the question right. Always be polite and respectful. It's, a, it's an uneven situation. You're not peers. They are judges, and you are the judged. Too bad. That's, life is tough. Always be polite and respectful. Never be defensive. Even if it, it's unlikely that you will get an attack question, but not impossible. Right? If, if you're feeling attacked, count to three, take a sip of water, and give a polite, respectful answer. Right? Always give crisp answers. Do not ramble on. Do not filibuster. Do not go into long, involved explanations. Why? The short, short answers mean you get more questions. More questions you get means you give more answers. The more answers you give, the more fill-in you're doing on blanks and questions that they, that they are worried about. You want to answer as many questions as you possibly can in that time. You don't want to give them long lectures. You want to go bang, bang, bang. Because there's, there's 12 of them, right? And if they each have two questions, that's 24 questions. You, you're not even going to get to all the questions they have. So don't talk, don't give long, involved answers. And the best tip of all is be f start to anticipate the questions. When, you, when your pitch deck gets to be pretty stable and you think you got it right, sit down and say, what are the questions that they're going to ask me? And get that question ready now. So for example, you're going to show a very simplified financial statement. They're quite likely to ask you about details on your financial statement. And you want to have a backup slide. You want to have something that you can pull out, but anticipate what are the three questions they're going to ask you about your financials. Because you didn't show it to me. You don't have time. Right? They're going to ask you about the competition. What are they going to ask you about the company? Anticipate as many of those questions as you can and be ready with a bang, 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 thank you very much, next question answer. With me, Melanie. So, what I know of angel investors is they really, and any investor, really hate BS. So, is it a good format if they ask you a question you do not know the answer to? And I've heard angel investors say, do not make shit up on the spot. It's better to say, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know, and fill in the closest thing you know to the truth, but they want to ask the question about the, the market, and you've done your customer discovery interviews. Maybe you don't know a percentage of the overall, maybe that you didn't get that research, you know, from your, you know. Mm -hmm large aggregate data research, let's say, but you did do 100 customer discovery interviews, you say, I don't know the aggregate number, I do know 
this is the, of the 100 people I spoke to, 50 said this. Yes. Simple answer is yes. I mean, I, I think that's good advice, right? If you, if you can say something intelligent on a, on a related topic, do it. But, but, don't, but don't be ashamed to say, I don't know. And so, so, I mean, again, in this context, these folks are really rooting for you, right? They're all GW alums. They're benefactors. They, 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 they bleed bluff, buff and blue, right? They want you to succeed. They're not trying to trick you up. And so saying, look, I really don't know. Maybe we could talk offline about that. I'd love to hear more. But, and, and then to Melanie's point, you know, but I do know these other th three things that are, that are related. That's, not, that's, not, that's a good, st good strategy for answering the questions, right? All right, so predict the answers, right? At this level in the competition, it's often the Q&A that decides who wins. The canned presentations are, are uniformly good. Yes, sir? Is it okay to have different team members answer different questions, or is it better to just have the founder and I think it's better to have different team members answer different questions. Um, generally, I'm, I'm guessing you'll have you know, different areas of expertise. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, being able to compliment. So, so listening to one, one person answer a question and, they have some, and then somebody else come in and supplement, say, oh, by the way, in addition to what, what Mary said, uh, you, know, be, you should be aware of this as well is a good strategy. Yeah, I would, I would spread it around. Re recall that in, 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 the, in the rules, everybody has to present. So every team member has to be part of the presentation. Right? Okay. All right. How are we doing here for time? Where are we doing? All right. So let me just quickly tell you the other approaches. Now I've told you my way. There are some other ways. So uh, Lilo Sitterman does a very nice job on, on, on her perfect pitch deck, right? So she has some rules, only 28-point font. I violated that. I like 24. I, I can do 24. She likes big font. She says, know your audience. That's certainly true. Don't focus on your solution slide, right? So some presenters fall in love with their technology. They fall in love with their app. And when they get up in front of, the, of, of, the, of the, the judges, they spend three, four minutes talking about the ins and outs of their app. Death, bad use of your time. You've got, you got a minute to describe your product. Don't fall in love with your technology. And that, that's one of her main messages. So there's the address on, on YouTube video. Very good. Here's her deck. Right? So she has a nine-slide deck. Mine was 18. Right? She starts with her elevator pitch, right? the 30-second line. Problem, solution, addressable market. Financial revenue, the team, everybody does the team, competition, development plan, and then contact information. You won't need this in the new venture competition, but in any slide deck you send to investors or you, or you pitch to, to outside people, always put your contact information in there. Right? The, the last thing you want to do is send out a deck and have somebody say, I really like this deck. How do I find this person? And they can't, right? So put your, put your phone number in there. Guy Kawasaki is one of the, you know, the West Coast gurus. Um, he has a, he has a, a great... A, a, a nice video on how to pitch investors. He's famous for the 10, 20, 30 rule, right? Only 10 slides, no more than 20 minutes, we're okay there. And no font smaller than 30 point for him, right? Obviously not in the Lex McCusker school of pitching, right? Here's his, here's his 10 slide deck. A title deck, title, problem solution, business model, underlying magic, that's what makes you special. He, he's coming from a high tech Silicon Valley uh, culture, right? But he wants to know, what, what's your magic sauce? What have you got that nobody else got? Right? Marketing and sales competition team, financial projections, and then your status and timeline. Starting to see a pattern here, some things that are recurring. Right? They all have problem and solution. Right? They all have competition. They all have team. David S. Rose, I talked about David Rose uh, early on. We talked about what uh, investors are looking for. He, this is a very good video. Um, he wants. VCs are interested in you, build connection with the audience, and he also likes sparse slides. His deck is a 13-slide deck. He likes a logo, something that's nice and memorable that you can, you can carry away with you. An overview slide, the team, the market, the product, business model, strategic relationships. He's looking for who your partners were in your business model canvas. Competition barriers to entry, you get the list. His, his is geared to uh, folks who are asking for lots of money, so he, he has a specific ask. ask yeah. So a bunch of different ways to do this, generally more concise than I, than I have advised you, generally more visuals, less text than I like. Um, try them out. Try them out. Yes, ma'am.
things that, not against them, but like you, so for example, my product involves mental health. Mm -hmm. And I said to one of them, who's a mother, what if your child came to you, I know that you're a mother of two, what if your child came to you with this problem, would you feel this way? Would that be too bold and touchy, or is that what you want us to do and and connect them to what? I don't know the answer to that. It's, it sounds borderline creepy to me. <laughs> so I might, but I might use the same tactic slightly differently. So I might say, imagine a mother whose child has this problem and needs this. So rather than doing that particular one like I've been stalking you, <laughs> more like, here's a general problem that lots of people have. Now the fact that, that she has it too is nice, helps you, right? So that, and then yeah, just subtly that's different from what you were proposing. Yeah. Sir? If there are one or two or three points in the presentation that are fairly straightforward and obvious but should be included, mm-hmm. is it okay to put them on your slides and bullets and then not talk about them? Absolutely. If you've got stuff that's really easy to understand and really, really easy to apprehend and doesn't require time, use that time all elsewhere. I mean, you, you, your, your temporal real estate is, is, is all you have. You've got 12 minutes. So if you, can, if you can make important points without spending time on it, that's weight very much to your advantage. Huh? Other questions? OK. Um, so the Audience Choice Award, quickly. The, uh, recall that, that for those of you in the competition, you've got to pitch twice. Right? During the day is for the big money with the judges. At night, it's a five-minute pitch. And people will be voting on a, on a mobile phone app for the Audience Choice Award. So it's different. Um, getting them up the hill is much more important because right? you don't have very much time. And luckily, you don't have time for them to fall down the hill, right? Um, it's, it's a younger audience, so um, yeah, the rules are what they are. If I were a student in this competition, I would fill the room up with all my buddies <laughs> and give them the URL and say, vote for me, right? So you're going to get students. You're going to get you know, entire fraternities will be there. So it's a young audience. I won't say they're superficial, but they're less skeptical, right? You want to entertain them. So, so make it lively. Make it fun, right? Get them engaged. Uh, so here, I would use lots of visuals, right? I wouldn't use uh, you know, even 24-point pitch, right? Uh, lots of images. <coughs> it's not connecting with the, th- with the 12 or 13 judges, right? It's not that eye contact and personal connection. Now you've got a big audience. You've got to, it's 200 people, so you've got to kind of play a little bigger on the stage, right? And you want to be memorable. The time is particularly short, so I advise, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll hit this point in a few minutes, rehearse, 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 rehearse with a stopwatch. Right? At, at, at some point, kind of in the middle of April, this thing should be really coming together for you because you want to spend time working, um, working a lot on the presentation, on just the, just the theatrics. Right? You've got to get the, the thinking is, is kind of over at some point, and you've got to start working on and timing matters, right? Because you're going to get, you're going to get, there's a hook, right? It's like vaudeville. When the five minutes is up, you're coming off. Yep. OK. So these are the kind of slides, these sparse slides, right? So this is, this is Jobs talking about the iPhone, right? This is the only, Jobs talked for 12 minutes here about iPhone sales, right? Different countries, different geographies, which models they sold. That's the only slide he used. And what's the meta message, right? What does he want you to come away with? We sold a boatload of these phones, right? And he wants you watching him while he's pre- presenting. Right? He doesn't want you reading the slides. It's, it's, it's a different approach. It's frankly, it's, it's the approach that's favored most nowadays. All right. Let's use the last, the remaining time we have to talk about a bunch of general purpose things, things that, that are true for any kind of presentation. Doing a sales presentation, you're um, uh, you know, presenting to folks at a, at, a, at a fraternity meeting or something. It's, this is, this is not, not the, what, what remains now is not specific to pitching to investors. Right? So here's the topics I want to talk about. Uh, first, I want to talk about the, the dreaded fear of presenting. I'll tell you why. Um, and it's easy to say, but there's no reason to be afraid of this. Right? Then I'm talking about thinking about the purpose of your presentation. What is it you're really trying to accomplish here? Right? And, and this, Talk about a bunch of meta issues, and then specific elements of your presentation. We'll talk about the content, your voice, visuals, actions, time management, and then dealing with stress and anxiety. My 
reference for this is a talk by Linda Maddox from the Business School. This is also on, the, on our website uh, and, and, and on her own YouTube channel. Linda does a beautiful job on this. Goes out, it's about an hour and a half. It's much better than I do, and I won't completely do it justice. But if you want to know general principles and great advice for how to do all sorts of pitches, I recommend Linda's, Linda's video. So, fear of presenting. It's easy to get nervous and to be fearful in front of an audience like this. These are very experienced, smart people. The good news is you are the smartest person in the room when you're giving this talk on this topic. You know more about this than any of these folks. Um, the, and the good news is in this particular contest, this is not Shark Tank. These are people who really love you. They come in wanting you to be successful. Um, so I, I don't have any like, good advice for you. Um, drink heavily. No, don't drink heavily. But, <laughs> but it, it, it's easy to say, but this is not a context where you need to be, need to be worried or fin feel self-conscious. In fact, you will be most successful if you, and I've said this before, if you let the real you come through by just letting them see you in your innate wonderfulness, you'll do fine. I mean, you all, I, I, I know most of you, and um, they just want to know you and, and get to and see, see who you really are. So try, try, to de try not to, to, to let, the, let the fear get the better of you. Now, why are you presenting? Let's take a minute. So imagine you're in, you're in the new venture competition, right? It's April 19th. Just I mean, take a step back. What are you trying to accomplish? What is the purpose of your presentation? Is it to inform and educate? To some extent it is, right? There's lots of facts you want to convey. So, so you, better, you better be able to inform and educate them on your venture and why it's a good idea and what you've learned about the market. So this is certainly part of it. It's not all of it, though. What else? Do you want to persuade them? Sure you do. You want to persuade them to score you all those sevens on the right side of the, right? You want to persuade them that you know what you're talking about, that your story, your narrative arc about how this big problem out there is addressable by your solution. You want to persuade them of that, right? So those are important things to do. And you can, con you can construct your talk to do these two things and be very successful. I will argue it's not enough. You also want to entertain and even inspire them. Right? And ultimately, you want to cause them to take action. Right? So think big about this. Right? Think about making sure that it's fun and lively and they have a good time. Don't be afraid to tug on their heart string strings. Don't be afraid to make them want to support you because they think it is the best thing they can do on this earth with their money. Because they like your cause, because they like your product, or because they like you and they want you to succeed. Think about how to inspire them. And of course, the best outcome would be if they pull you aside and say, I'd like to invest in your company right now. I'd like to invest my own money in your company. Right? That would be a nice outcome. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. Think big. Shoot for the stars. You are great. If you have gotten this far, you are worthy of, of inspiring these people. Okay. Now, here's some nuts and bolts stuff. Remember we talked about connecting with them. There's only 12 of them. There's only 12 that matter in this particular case. Make eye contact. And make eye contact for one to three seconds because you are important to me. It seems hokey, but you want to make eye contact. Understand? I'll tell you a quick story. Um, I had a chance to meet Bill Clinton many, many years ago. I invited to the White House, so I'm going to tell you why. I'm not a big fan of Bill Clinton. It's in incidental to the when Clinton leaves after giving his talk, he, he goes through the crowd. He doesn't just walk out. He comes down and, and he goes up, down every aisle and meets people. And he stops at my aisle. And he comes up to me and he goes, yes, may I? Thank you. Thank you for coming. The wrist grab, the shoulder grab. He looks me in the eye. And, and there was a moment there when I thought that Bill and I were just a 
BFFs. <laughs> he liked me more than anybody in the world, and I liked him too. We, we were close. I believed it. He's a pro. He, and then he, you know, he went to 200 people who all came out with the same feeling, right? It seems corny, but connect with these people on a human level. Don't be, af don't be afraid to go right to them. So now, th this is kind of a variant on, on your question, right? So if there, there are people in, in, the, in, the, in this judging pool who are going to be really sympathetic to your particular technology or your cause, don't be afraid to, to go extra hard to connect with them. Make sure they love you, right? And eye contact is huge. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, how would you suggest introducing yourself? Is there a certain way that is? I can tell you what most folks do, and it seems to work pretty well. When they, when they come in, to the, the judges will be lined up in the front row, go down the receiving line like it's a wedding, and give them a nice hearty handshake, make eye contact, introduce us, say hi. I'm Lex McCusker. I'm very pleased to meet you. Um, do your homework. Call them by name. You know, uh, Mrs. Scott, very nice to see you, right? Pleasure to meet you. I've been looking forward to. So I would do all of that. I would, I would, I would just go right down the line and, and meet with them. Yeah. Okay, we talked about being authentic. You don't have to be any taller. You don't have to be any smarter. You don't have to be any techier. You don't have to be any businessy. You're, you're good just the way you are. Just be who you are when you talk to these folks. But I do want you to show enthusiasm. So let me tell you another story. I. I have calibrated my presentation monitor. So I know that when I'm giving a presentation, if I feel that I've got the right amount of enthusiasm, then I'm giving a very bad talk. And here's what I've done. I've, 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 given, I've given talks and then I've videotaped them. I said, boy, he's lively, he's doing it, he's up there, he's, he's jiving, he's really moving, he looks great. That's, I feel great. And I look at the video and say, what's that guy? He's dead. He's dull. I hate him. So I know that I have to crank up what I feel about the presentation to where I feel I'm being silly. I'm telling you. I, I just know this about myself. I've calibrated myself. When I feel I'm being really out there and acting like a complete jerk, and I look at that video afterwards, I say, perfect. He's right on target. Just the right level of enthusiasm. Do the same thing for yourself. Go give that talk where you feel like you've got the that you've got it right, and then go look at the video and say, do I have it right? And if you have to, crank the dial up, or crank it down maybe, but calibrate how you feel with what you want to be on that screen. Right? Enthusiasm matters. Work hard on your pitch. I know you guys have been working hard. I know you've been at this since January. For those of you who worked all fall on this, you're only halfway there. You've got to work really hard on this pitch. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Here's why. To, to be competitive at this level of the competition, in those 12 minutes when you're pitching, you don't have, you can't use any brain power thinking about what you're going to say. What do you mean? I'm going to give a pitch for 12 minutes, I'm not going to think about what I've got to say? Right. It's got to be automatic poker by this time. By the time you get there on April 19th, the, the actual finding the words, telling the story, saying what you're going to say, you have, you have done it so many times that that's easy. That you can do in your sleep. Because you're going to use all your mental powers, all your cognitive ability to, to work on the performance. Right? When an actor goes on the stage to, read, to, to perform Shakespeare, they're not thinking, what's the next line? What's the next line? The lines come automatically because they're going to work on gestures and they're going to work on form and they're going to work on eye contact and they're going to work on dramatic pauses and they're going to work on emphasis. That's what you have mind. That's what your, your brain shrinks when the lights go on, right? right? Your mental capacity gets like the size of a pea. So all of this presentation stuff has got to be automatic because you're going to, you, I'm telling you, you're going to use every bit of mental ability you have just on the performance. And the only way to get there is, is, is practice, practice, practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall, right? You've got to say it 10 times. You've got to do it 20 times before you come into that thing. That show. All right, more stuff. We talked about the narrative arc. Make sure you have a nice story to tell. Should you have handouts? Generally, no. 
it's possible if you have some complicated uh, financials and you get a question about it that you might want to have a handout to do your detailed financials. Avoid it. Don't give it out unless it's asked for. By and large, handouts don't seem to work. I can think of a couple of examples when you might. We talked about samples. If you have samples of the product, that's great. Um, spending time on a demo, I think, is generally a good idea. If, you, if there's some way you can do it in 30 seconds, you can't use more than that of your 12 minutes. But making sure, that you, again, you've got to make sure they get the product, how it works, the service, how it works. They've got to understand that. And if it takes you a minute to do that, then you've got to spend that minute. So some kind of a demo is good. Uh, verbal, less is more when you're talking, right? So this is, you know this quote from, from Mark Twain, right? I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead, right? Kind of refine your words, take time, kind of boil it down, get it really, really crisp, and then be personally entertaining, right? Your, your tone of voice should vary. There should be rises and falls. You should emphasize things that are important. That dramatic pause, right, on something that is really important, right? Those kind of goofy things matter, right? And, and practice them, practice them. Silence is profound, right, in one of these things. People talk around and rap, rap. If you stop, everybody pays attention, right? So that the, where you use silence in your talk is, is, is very powerful. It's, it's, it's something you want to use to emphasize important points. All right. Images are hugely valuable. If you can get an image to go on your slide that really captures the point you're trying to make, that, that information is conveyed in, in some kind of super bandwidth, right? thousands of times faster than, than words. Right? I do like video. Be careful. Remember, live demos, when do you do a live demo? Never, never. But a canned demo is OK. Think about that. Right? Um, spend a little bit of time on common on look and feel on your slides. Your slides should be branded, right? They should, they should know your slide deck is different from other people's slide deck, right? Same color scheme, that, that kind of stuff matters. Um, very consistent, never, never less than 24 point font. Too hard to read. Some obvious stuff, do spell check, right? Nice sharp contrast, right? Light blue on dark blue is not easy to see. Might be, might be uh, stylish or, or attractive otherwise, but Make sure it's easy. In terms of mechanics, use a remote control. There'll be a, there'll be a clicker up on the stage. You should, uh, you should step through your slides. Um, you must never look at your slides. Never is too strong. But don't, don't speak to the slides. Don't ever speak to the slides. Right? You, you can't afford to turn away from the people. You're, you're not, the slides are already convinced. You don't, have to, you don't have to convince them. right? Spend all of your time facing the audience. That means you've got to kind of be pretty familiar with the slides and know what's up there and know what's next. Um, should you read? Generally, you should not read. Now, having said that, I, I've <coughs> been with several folks, especially students, who absolutely cannot stand up and pitch without holding in their hand a deck of cards that has all the, all what they're going to say on it. And if you need that, that crutch, you need that uh, security blanket, I don't know what the right metaphor is, then do it. You want to convince these people that you are speaking from your heart. Right? This is not something you've memorized or a talk you've written down. This is you bearing your soul to them. And the way they do that, by the way, is, is to write it down and memorize it and, and practice it so many times that it looks automatic. Right? But it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like a, uh, you know, a, uh, an agreement that, that, that you've both made where you pretend to be spontaneous and natural and they pretend to believe it. Dress the part. When you come in, you should, you, should be, you should show them who you want them to see. So who do you want to be on that day? Do you want to be Face or Murdoch or uh, Hannibal or, or BA? You guys, you guys don't even know who the A team is, do you? Oh, geez, I forgot. I forgot. Something from, from another generation, right? These are characters in a, uh, in a TV show. But you can tell, right? BA stands for bad attitude, right? I mean, he's, he's a tough guy, right? And then Face is the smooth guy, right? He's gonna, he's gonna, and Murdoch was the technician, right? He can't see that. So who's this guy? Who does he want you to see? Too cool for school, right? He, he wouldn't wear a necktie if his life depended on it, right? 
Silicon Valley entrepreneur. That's who he wants you to see. How about these guys? Four MBAs, right? They want you to see MBA. They got matching vests, right? We are so, we are so buttoned down. That's what they want you to see. How about these guys? This guy is a uh, med school professor, but he's dressed in, he's dressed in business, ca business attire, right? He wants you to see that he's a business guy. This guy comes in a, in a smock, and he's got a, a stethoscope around his, around his neck, right? Right? He's the techie. He's the, he's the medical school guy. So think about what you wear. By and large, professional business attire is the default. So if you, but don't be afraid to be a little imaginative about, about, about what you wear, right? In terms of presenting, practice, practice your presentations as a team, right? The, handover, the, the, the handovers matter, and you don't need to introduce each other, right? You just want to go from one to the other, right? Everybody's got to speak. Every team member has to speak. Uh, don't say, now, now, John, take it over. Don't waste that time. Just, just go smooth, one from right into the other. Yeah, we got to finish up here. All right. Um, be sure you introduce the team members. Um, I think you do that at the beginning. Um, if not, when you put up the team slide, you should do so. But make sure that everybody knows everybody on the team. Um, when you're not presenting, right, if there's four of you standing up there and John on the end is presenting, Everybody else has to act like they're really interested in what John is saying. Don't wander off. You know, don't look at your watch or think about what you're going to say. You want to, you're part of the show. All four people are part of the show all the time. So sh look at him like you're really interested. And oh, by the way, you should be really interested because if he stumbles or forgets or gets lost or doesn't make a point, you've got to help him out. So it's, it's perfectly okay for somebody else on the team to step in and say, oh. And, and, you know, and John, one other point that, that, that we want to make clear is that our gross margins do get to be 60% in the, in the fourth year, because John forgot to say that. So be engaged all the time, even when you're not speaking. And you want to avoid the general uh, nervous movements and pointing and gestures. I, I do that all the time. In some cultures, pointing is a bad thing, so be careful about pointing. Um, and then as to answer the question I've answered three times already, I think when you come in, you shake hands with all of the, uh, all of the judges. Don't have to. I mean, if you don't, if you don't want to do that, that's fine with me. But uh, A couple of other things. Figure out your lap times. So you should sort of know at what point in the 12 minutes every, every piece should be, right? So if, if the sixth slide should come up at minute four and you're not there, you want to be able to in real time make adjustments. So you should sort of know what you're going to skip over if you, if you get get behind. Um, think about how you would, how you would make up time if you, uh, if you get lost. The first 12 minutes are uninterrupted, so you won't get any questions. All right. Now, stress and anxiety, the last thing. We talked about fear. It's okay to be a little nervous. In fact, it's desirable to be a little nervous, right? You know about the Yerkes Dodson curve? Oh, come on. Tell me you don't know what that is. This is the, this is the, the, the graph that uh, relates performance to your anxiety or arousal level, right? And it's this inverted U-shape curve, right? So if you're too relaxed, your performance is not very high, right? So resting heartbeat is what, 100, 120 beats a minute, right? You're sitting there watching TV. Not at your best performance-wise. As your heartbeat gets up to 100, 145 beats a minute, now you start to get to peak performance. You want to be a little bit on edge when you get in there, a little bit nervous, you know, stay frosty. Now, when you get up high and start to get to 180, 200 beats per minute, you become a basket case and your performance de degrades again, right? So let's not go too far, but it's okay being a little nervous. It's okay to be confident, not smug, not arrogant, but you're the expert in you and you're the expert in this, in this venture. Take your time, pause, look around. If you do get anxious, take a breath. There'll be water up on the stage. Take time out, walk over, take a sip of water just, just to calm yourself down. Perfectly sensible thing to do. No, one, no one's uh, kept Marco Rubio from becoming president, but in, in your case, the stakes are much lower. Right? Um, and, and I said this a couple of times, but it's worth repeating. This particular audience is rooting for you. They want you to be successful. There's no reason to be nervous or anxious in front of these folks. And with that, open the floor for questions. Comments? Yes, sir. Um, they tend to ask about equity breakdown with their partners and, and or 
where should you bring that up when you do introductions? Ah, that's a good question. That's a good question. I would not make it part of your formal presentation. It, it seems like a second order issue to me. At, at the same time, the judges are going to care that the team members are invested, figuratively, in the venture. So they, they will like the idea that you all have an ownership stake and are committed to the long-term viability of the venture. And a good way to convey that is to say, and you know, we, there are four of us and we own uh, four equal shares in the company. Shows that A, you've thought about it, and, and B, that, they, that everybody has an ownership stake. So I guess I've argued both sides of it, haven't I? Um, I wouldn't make a big deal out of it. I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. But it's a nice way to convey that the team is committed to the venture. Can you ever have too many people out there? Yes. In our competition, you're allowed to have four. The most angel investment pitches I've ever been to, there is rarely, rarely more than one. Usually one person pitches all the whole thing. Yeah. Sir. Yeah, so in, in early stage companies like this, like, like the ones that are the student companies that are in our, our investment, and, and so I'll try to give you a short and sweet answer. Typically, angel investors invest early stage, and they invest when companies are risky. They will invest between 200000 and maybe as much as a million dollars. They typically like to get 20%, 15 to 25% of a company. They don't want to own more than half. Um, now, having said that, there's a lot that goes into that, right? So remember that when you, when you make an investment, when one makes an investment in a company, it depends on what the valuation of that company is and, and hence what percentage of the company of that valuation you're buying when you, when you make an investment. So for most of you, you don't want to be taking investor money at this point because your valuations of your company will be very low. And so even to take uh, a fifty dollars or $100,000 investment, you're going to have to give up a very large hunk of your company. So you want to avoid taking that, that outside investment as long as you can. As your company progresses, as you get more customers, as you get more traction, as you start to generate revenue, the value of your company will go up and up. And so the amount that you have to give away for a fixed amount of investment will go down. Yeah. Is that responsive to your question? So in the new venture competition, it's not required. To, to go in front of an angel investor or an investor group, they are very unlikely to invest in you if you are pre-revenue. No, not completely. So if you have a pharmaceutical product, right? Pharmaceutical products take years to go through clinical trials and get to the marketplace. And uh, folks invest a lot of money into pharmaceutical products very early on. Um, if you have a software product, or an app, almost impossible to get investment money until you've got some traction and, and show that there are customers who want to pay for this. Or at least, at least large amounts of eyeballs coming to your website. Ma'am. Okay, so I was very um, surprised when reading judges' feedback where you would get two comments next to each other. One judge would say, I really like this, and the other judge said, this could never work. Why is she writing this? Um, so I'm wondering, <laughs> uh, carrying this over to the, to the panel phase, um, to the presentation phase, um, when you have people in the audience who you can tell um, are really going along with your presentation and are excited, mm -hmm. And then you look over and you have other people who you can tell are kind of struggling to get there. Mm -hmm. Who do you appeal to? And what kind of mindset do you focus on? Bringing everyone along to a point or getting the excited people more excited and ready to invest in you? So you ask a great question. So one of our dirty little secrets is that it's a very imperfect process. In fact, we've done some work where we've gone back over the years and looked through which teams did well in the competition and where they are now. Um, it's often the case that teams that, that, that did just OK in the competition were the most successful companies. So the judges are, are not infallible. And in fact, uh, 
and the example that you cite is not so extreme. They often contradict each other. They like what they don't like. Now, to answer your question directly, I, I would, if I were you, to the extent you can, I'm not sure how, how much latitude you have, but well, you can call on questioners. I would go after the ones who are skeptical and are not with you. In general, the high scores bump up against the, the limit. So if they really like you, they're going to give you sevens, and you're not going to make them go to eight. But if you've got somebody who's a two and you could bring them to a five, that will help you the most. Ma'am. You're asking how high is the sky and how deep is the ocean, right? So it's, 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 I mean, do you have like an average or an idea? Yeah, so, so I'll ask my favorite quiz question. Why, why do startups fail? What's the number one reason why startups fail? There's lots of reasons. What's the number one reason? Mitchell? There's no market for it. Yeah, there's no market for it. So, there's no market. They build, they build a product that nobody wants. It's, it's a remarkable phenomenon, right? It's, it's, the, it's the field of dreams. Oh, I got this wonderful app, and all I got to do is put it out there, and people will buy it. So to answer your question, you want to have enough sales <coughs> to convince them that there really is a market for this. So you want to show them that, that people are lapping, up, lapping this thing up. They really like it. And that's the best thing you can do. You can do interviews. You can go talk to customers and say, uh, you know, get endorsements and testimonials. But you want to see sales and you want to see enough Tra trajectory matters. <coughs> so you want to show that it's increasing over time, right? So you can make some sort of claim that this is going to go on forever, you know, and it's, it's only, you know, $1,000 this week, but it doubled, you know, next month it's 2,000, you know, 30 days from now it's going to be 100 million, right? So, so looking for trends. So. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, what we will do this year is we will put an iPad in front of you, a monitor on the stage, and it counts down from 12 minutes to zero. So you'll know exactly how much time you have left. Yes? The first, the round in front of the judges, is that going to be on stage or is that going to be in like, No, it's all, everything is in, um, is oh. in Jack Morton Auditorium. I was the timer yeah. last year and I was like the friendly face, like nodding. So I'll be there like smiling and nodding like an idiot for all the teams. <laughs> so you want to look at for, somebody else. Friendly face matters. Having a friendly face in the audience is it's very reassuring. I won't talk to you, though, but I want to distract you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, you have an event coming up in Boston. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be integrity of uh, angel investors? Because uh, like, you're not hiring angel investors. Mm. Wow. So um, nothing, nothing surefire. I mean, obviously Google. I mean, make sure find them on LinkedIn, find them on Google, see what what's written about them. There are some sites like Gust that uh, that, that do profiles of investors as well as companies. Sometimes you can find information there. I'm afraid that the the, the single best answer is going to be word of mouth. You're going to want just as investors like warm introductions, right, they don't generally don't respond to cold calls. But if somebody says, uh, you know, I know this, this guy, he's, uh, he's, he's got an interesting investment, you should talk to him. Um, I would stay away from investors without, uh, without, unless you can get a reference from them for the reasons that you cite. Right? But that's an unfortunate story. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, simple answer is yes. You can, you, there, there are lots of good ones just on the, on the internet that you can use. Many, most investors won't sign a non-disclosure agreement because uh, they're afraid that you're going to disclose to them something that they've heard a million times before and all of a sudden they're now bound by your non-disclosure agreement even though it's, it's an idea that, that they have heard before and now they're in, up, up the creek, right? So. 
Um, you know, there, and there are also, there, you know, there are lots of angel groups that are well respected, right? So there's Dingman Angels in, in, in College Park. There's the Koretsu Forum. Uh, the DC Archangels are, are groups of kind of respectable people who meet as, as angels. Um, if, let me know. If you want to get in front of an angel group, uh, follow up with me and I can, I, I can help you with that. All right, team, last call. Everybody's okay? Feeling armed and dangerous? All right. Well, thanks very much for coming. Good to see you all.